And that's why we, my family wasn't really religious, because for over 100 years, this atheism propaganda was really taught in schools and everyone. They were trying to gut parents. Islam for a century. Yeah. yeah. So having to actually write a paper on the existence of God, that was kind of like, I was kind of like mind struck, like what do I even write? Like my paper was blank for about a week. It was like, I didn't even know what to write. And what we often do in our study of history, these last 400 years, the most recent 400 years, is we separate the Islamic history, Islamic scholarly history, hmm. from the political history. We as, the, as though they're two separate subjects. Islam, religion and politics are never separate. Hmm. They're never separate. The, the state or forces or money is always involved in what becomes the dominant narr narrative. Hmm. Now think about that for a moment. Parents are a core part of your identity, right? Both physically and psychologically and socially, in every yeah. way, right? Now take that back. Who's our parent? Adam. Adam. Like if you don't know your parent, then you don't really know you. <laughs> the way Allah talks about Adam, mm. in Surah Al-Baqarah, mm. some of that is also the way He talks about the Israelites. Bismillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaikum salam Let's start by introducing yourselves Okay, my name is Saeed Beck But you also I go with Saeed Arislanov I'm originally from Uzbekistan I was born and raised there So I came to US when I was 18 in 2012 Okay So I've been living in the US And doing my best here in the US 2018 you said? Uh, 2012 2012, sorry, yeah 2012 It's been like 12 years now. Wow, mashallah where do you live in the U.S.? Uh, I live in Virginia, right next to D.C. and DMV area. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm so familiar. I life. spend a little bit of time in... You've been there a lot. We've met a lot. Yeah, there. I lived there for a little bit. You do? I lived in Alexandria for a little bit. <laughs> I didn't nice. tell anybody, but uh, <laughs> I did. <laughs> Was that before or after like the... I'm not resume. telling you the timeline. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, mm. we hope to see you there again. Yeah, I don't. I don't like it, but I'll, <laughs> come, but I'll come. I have some very good, very close friends in DC. Actually, um, mm -hmm. I go often. Every couple of months, I'm in Virginia, DC, especially Tyson's every area. Of month. Every couple of months, yeah, because I have some very, very close friends from God, my college days. Ah, uh, uh -huh. Where do they yeah. live? Uh, that's personal. Okay. <laughs> they live in Alexander. Tyson's area. <laughs> they live in the Tyson's area. Okay. And they're, okay. they're a bunch of my old New York friends. They moved out there. Nice. So nice. I just go hang out with them and we just sit and talk all night. Okay. We do so that sometimes. I, no. It's not really enticing to invite them here to Texas. <laughs> so I go there. We'll try to catch you next time then. Yeah, inshallah. <laughs> you know, one thing, I, if I were to ever leave uh, Dallas, I'd probably move to D.C. Oh. If, if anything, we'll I can't think of that. anywhere else in the country. And there, I have a reason for that. Not because it's pretty, because I don't think it's pretty. It's there's a brain drain I feel, mm -hmm. or there's a ceiling. There's a there's a there's an intellectual ceiling in many parts of the country, right? And that's because it's a lot of a lot of places are insulated, mm. right? So there's mashallah brilliant people everywhere, mm. right? But you have like you know there's industries, right? There's the tech industry is big and and oil and gas is big in Texas, mm. right? Or the medical industry or whatever. So you have these professionals that are accomplished in these fields. They're here, right? But we don't have an influx of historians and political scientists and sociologists and anthropologists mm. and researchers and dignitaries and ambassadors. You, you don't have that, right? Yeah. DC is one of those places. Not only is it, you know, a, a hotspot for universities, um, but it's also, you know, because of Washington DC, so many intellectuals fly in from around the world mm -hmm. there. So I get to be in a place where I can learn from people just in conversation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And even though I benefit a lot from local discussions, there's still a cap. I feel a cap in suburbia. Yeah. You yeah. know, mm. that I, I'm drawn to a place where I can constantly grow or I can gain perspective I didn't have before. Mm. And every time I've gone to D.C., I've experienced that. Yeah. yeah. You know. I live close to Dulles Airport. Okay. And we see a lot of planes in and out, but I see a lot of private jets like flying in and out. So that <laughs> yeah. makes it right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
What about yourself? Uh, my name is Anan. I'm actually Palestinian, and uh, but I was born and raised in Saudi, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, until what age? Until 18. Wow, mashallah. Until actually, him and I actually same age, and we came to <laughs> the United States the same year too. Actually, we came. I came in 2012, and uh, yeah, I've lived here ever since. And I actually never went back to Saudi, and not even not even for a visit till just last week. So you came here same age. Yeah. 18. 18. Yeah. Did you speak English when you came here? I mean, you don't really speak the language of the country until you go to the country. But I mean, in Arab standards, yeah, I spoke a little bit. Yeah. You don't have an accent anymore. It's barely like it's like one percent. Yeah. I, uh, I could tell you Arabic, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, actually, my parents had me in. Uh, uh, what they call back home is the international school, which yeah. uh, they teach only in English. I was what uh, what city were you in? Uh, Riyadh. You were in Riyadh? Yeah. I was in Riyadh. Yeah, you were in Riyadh. <laughs> I was, was going to ask you about that, actually, see what you're, like, what you're, like, what. Yeah, so we what used to age? live in uh, Malav. Oh, Bil Malaz. Bil Malaz, 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 yeah. Malaz, yeah. Malaz, yeah. And yeah. Nasiriya was my school. What was it? There was a town called Nasiriya. Oh, Nasiriya. Yeah, yeah Nasiriya. Yeah. 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 Mashallah, until what age did you... We Where left Saturday. after the Gulf War. Mm. So we left in 92. Oh. I was there during the war. Oh. Okay. We were learning how to put gas masks on and all that stuff. <laughs> you remember? Yeah, I remember. I was in uh, seventh grade. Oh, well, well, I, Like we didn't go to seventh grade because the schools were in danger of being rocketed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we just stayed home for a year and just, you know, put newspapers on windows and, pl you know, uh, uh, light light rejecting plastic trash bags so that wow. that so if the, in case there's a ground invasion soldiers wouldn't think there's someone inside oh, wow. like they were training us to prepare for all these kinds of scenarios it's well, wild it's, yeah it is wild actually having to imagine especially like comparing it to the experience that i grew up in saudi it's kind of like one of the very safer areas that yeah no we, we experienced that vulnerability and my parents they're from pakistan yeah so they experienced the the 1965 and 1972 71 wars in Pakistan. So they had a little bit of being civilians in a war zone experience. Yeah. It was wild. Like every time the siren would go off, they'd know exactly what to do. Yeah. Stand in a doorway yeah. or make the kids, my sister and I, my sisters and I would lie down under a mattress in case debris falls. Yeah, yeah, like it's wild. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you guys were, parents were very well equipped for it. So. They, they knew what they were doing. Yeah. 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 There, was a, there was a Scud missile debris that fell. It was, a, it was a half a mile from our house. It leveled an entire apartment complex. Oh. Like it was a very wide, not an entire, half of it was just gone. It was like a slice of cake. Wow. It was just gone. And you could see the insides of people's house when we drove to school. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, I would be actually like a, somewhat of a, mashallah, a, a traumatizing experience actually to have to go through that. But I, I was too young and stupid to think it was traumatizing. <laughs> I just thought it was exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it was like no school, like movies. The alarm the goes on. Like, you know, like, I'm in the middle of playing tag with my sister, and I'm, and I'm like, okay, I gotta go. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, no, uh, my uh, my parents had me in a in an only English speaking school in kindergarten. But then after that, my mom was very concerned about my brothers and I losing our Arabic. Because there was uh. such a focus on learning English and learning English, you know, the going to American universities and <laughs> learning English is basically the future. So my mom was very worried about the that influx of thought into the country is going to actually dilute my exp my knowledge in Arabic, my, both my brothers and I, hmm. um, I should, with three of us. And uh, she was like, I need them to learn Arabic and I need them to learn Islam. I need them to learn religion. So... English, I'll teach them myself like at home or like they will catch on to it. Or right. once I send them to the United States at some point, they'll learn themselves. They're just going to get it, yeah. Yeah, they'll just get it. But uh, but at, I don't know at what point in their future are they going to take to take it upon themselves to learn Arabic, to, to learn Islam. So I'm going to have to inf put them in a school that where they'll be infused into it. And then they'll, I'll, like, I'll just give them the basics and then they're on their own from there. So after kindergarten, they had me and my brothers into like an Arabic school. It's like Madaris uh, Ahliya, they called it. Hmm. So there was just all Arabic schools, uh, like very traditionally Muslim schools. So you went to very traditional Muslim schooling yeah. for a good number of years. Yeah, my, basically my entire life I was in the same school for from oh, basically wow. from Oh, wow. Was like an all-boys all type thing? All-boys. 
yeah, all boys type of thing. Actually, I was just telling him like uh, comparing our lives before and after we came to the United States. That's a it's a world of a difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, it would be normal for me to go two and three months without seeing a single woman besides my mom and my sister, and that'll be okay. That was that was our Saudi life. Yeah, that was Saudi life. Yeah, that exactly. was our Saudi, uh, same thing with me. Second yeah. second grade to eighth grade, that was what life looked like. Yeah, and even when I moved to Pakistan for almost a year, I was in a Pakistani school. Mm. Was it the it was same? All boys. Like, was it the same? All like, boys. Theme? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and, the, and the really messed up boys were waiting outside the girls' school. We'd walk by them and just go like this. <laughs> yeah, no, actually, there was like a, like a Berlin Wall between us. Wow. Between yeah, us and yeah, like we had these. that too. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and they, had, they had curtains like these, but two layers of them. Yeah. And then you'd have to call, I used to pick up my sister from school. Yeah. So I had to call her name on a mic outside the second curtain. Yeah. So that if she comes out of the first curtain... Nobody outside could get a glimpse into the school. Yeah. Then the second curtain. So behind her, you only see the first curtain. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Wow. That's wow. the level of like. And then she had the full on niqab on. You couldn't even show the eyes. Yeah. So I used to recognize her from her pumas. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's actually the same. still. I wouldn't. I, would, I mean, curtains aside, but it was still the same like similar similar like theme. I would have to. I didn't have like a sister, but uh, like my friends, they would have to go to the. Uh, they call them the bawab, the guy at the gate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they kind of get like, hey, I'm looking for, like, and he would just say her name, and then the guy would call out her name, and he would just be waiting there for his sister to come out, then he would take her to the car. Yeah. So, like, even the bad boys did not really stand a chance to be kind of quote unquote bad because you'll have to deal with the best brothers you can do is get fathers. a job as a gatekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. Basically, yeah. <laughs> what, I want to switch subjects a little bit. Like, yeah. With you, what was your relationship with Islam like growing up in Uzbekistan? Okay, so I was born in 1993. We got independence from Soviet Union like a couple of years back. Right. Two, three years. And that's why we, my family wasn't really religious. Because for over 100 years, this atheism propaganda was really taught in schools and everyone. They were trying to gut parents. Islam for a century. Yeah. 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 So when they first came in 1875, I guess, they started, there was like Mavaro Nahar. And they're like three emirates, like Bukhara, Hiva, and Kokan. So they took over, then they put the Soviet. There's a lot of big history there. Mm -hmm. But over 100 years, they were like atheism propaganda, the whole country. No religion. And though they didn't fully destroy it, but whoever tried to fight for religion, they were killed or they were just put in prisons, torture and all of that. And that's why I wasn't a very religious family. So the good thing is I went to a school, like similar school, like English specific. There was very one in the country. Even the president's grandson went to the same school as me. Oh, wow, okay. Like English. It was free, public, but mm. one of the top. That's why I had like a little bit English background, but there was no religious background at all. But the opposite is, we were scared of religion. I remember when I was either four or five years old, uh, our neighbor taught me the seven levels of hell. Like first level, you get to this torture. Second level, you get this torture. I'm like, this guy really love to punish people? I was very young. And whoever, if you try to learn religion, not me, like I was very young, but when I was really getting interested, they call it in Uzbek, Eskicha. It means like oldish. If you okay. want to study Arabic, uh, you want to become oldish, like that right. was the whole Soviet Union propaganda. Mm. Like right. it's old and that was their thing. Like religion is old. Now we got to get to a new world. Right. And You're backwards. Yeah. That same thing. Even mm. my mom, she still remembers the poems about Lenin, the Russian leader you uh, kidding from me? that time. Yeah. She still remembers that. Like from very childhood, there was. So, did you guys learn Uzbeki and Russian growing up? Uh, yeah, so Uzbek was my home language, right. my mother native language. We speak Uzbek. They didn't touch the culture; they only touched the really uh, the religion. Right. So we kept the culture, uh, and almost everybody speaks Russian, which is a good thing as well. In right. Your culture, like Russian, mm -hmm. Uzbek, and I went to English school. So yeah, after getting independent, it get, it started getting better. So people started studying actually, and before during the Soviet. I heard that a lot of people went to Europe to study, and when they came back, they were arrested by Soviet Union. Like, we don't need smart people here, kind of thing. Like, study what? Like, study engineering? No, or? worldly stuff, yeah. Wow. And that's why there are a lot of movement, like Jadid movement. They're like, okay, we have the religion, and now we need the worldly stuff. Uh, when they started teaching and preaching people, like, not just religion, this and that, they were all just either killed or executed. Wow. So they were really against, like, our... You're developing, developing new ideas right. and mm. 
Yeah. That's wild. So that's why when growing up, the religion uh, wasn't really part of my life when I was a kid. Yeah. And I was actually got scared of it. Like God really So by the time you were punish. 18 and you came here, what did what was your view of No, before Islam? that, I went to the Juma khutbah like okay. once when I was 15 or 14. Okay. That's when it started. I'm like, ah, no, nah, so Allah is not just someone who loves to punish. So just well, from one khutbah, it got started. So now I started getting interested in it. And then after coming to U.S., it got even better because here I have more freedom. <laughs> yeah. I used to hide, like, without telling my parents, I go to masjid and I'll study this and that. It wasn't too much, but the U.S., it gave me more opportunity. You to used study to hide religion. from your, wait, 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 hold on a second. You used to hide from your parents <laughs> to go to the masjid? Uh, yeah, I did. Even from my college back accent. home. In it back home as well, in here too. But it wasn't illegal to go to the masjid? No, no. No, they were like... But it was just the family was uncomfortable with kinda, it. Kind of, yeah. Just don't bother. Study. My father, he's, I thank him. He, this school was very far from our home. And we were rich. We were not. So we mm -hmm. were like middle school. So he school. invested a lot in your education. Yes. So we would study English. And he really invested in our studies. But he didn't want us to become really religious. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Sounds the more like you forbid, the more you want to do it. And <laughs> that's, that's actually very common in middle class families. Yeah. Uh, and families that want to see a better future for their kids uh, in many parts of the Muslim world, mm -hmm. including Pakistan, Bangladesh, other places, you'll have people that are like they want their kids to become an engineer, doctor, whatever mm -hmm. else. And they, then they see these like mullah types, these yeah. kids that went yeah. to the madrasa, they memorize the Quran, mm -hmm. they're imams of masjids, etc. And they live they, they don't move on, move on in the world. This is their world. And they are terrified that our kid will end up in this situation yeah. so even mm -hmm. if they touch religion they're just going to abandon their education their career everything mm -hmm. else and they're going to want to just move to the mountain somewhere mm -hmm. etc there's this terrible fear um I and that fear so is so so extreme that even when when many of those people were raised with those fears they mm -hmm. became parents themselves many of them moved to england united states australia etc so even within the american landscape you'll have people that are raised Muslim, but not cautiously not too Muslim, mm. because not too Muslim means you'll become one of those extreme mm. yeah. goat herders, yeah. right? So, yeah. and when their son or daughter goes to university, runs into an MSA, or here's a khutbah that that inspires them, and the girl decides that she's going to wear, start wearing hijab, or you start seeing a little bit of facial hair on the boy, he's 17, 18 years old. The parents exactly. freak out, like they freak out, like, what are you doing? This mm. is too extreme. Yeah. That's not what Allah wants from you, and they, because they know that that's what they think that's going to turn into is the worst of what they've seen in their society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? The, basically, the, the, the least respected class of your society is the religious clerics mm -hmm. and the, the, you know, these, these imams of masjids or whatever. They have, like, in, in that middle class, many of them, these people have no respect. These are the idiots of society mm -hmm. that want to take us back to the Stone Age yeah. or whatever, right? Yep. Yep. And so I used to get very angry about that sentiment mm -hmm. over time i became more uh I, I would say empathetic to that sentiment and i have it's it's more complicated than it first seems it's mm -hmm. like it says they're against islam yeah. they're actually not against islam per se they're against what they think is islam that's yeah. correct 100 percent. yeah right they, yeah. they just don't know that that's not a good representation of what the religion has to offer yeah Right. This is a religion of remarkable renaissance around the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this, is, this is a book I'm fascinated with uh, right now. It's written by an author in Michigan. Um, his name is Do Dr. Zulfiqar Ali Shah. Mm -hmm. And he wrote Islam and the English Enlightenment. Uh, and his next book is going to be about the American Enlightenment and its relationship with Islam. But man, it's mind blowing what we were and what we became and what some of these institutions were and what they became. There has been. It's hard to say, but there has been an intellectual decline in our institutions, mm. in our religious institutions that used to be far more diverse, far more open-minded, far more exploring. They were poly yep. multiple yep. science. Like, you know, you have a, a Western university has a science department, like a physics department, chem, chem bio, mm. and they'll have a political science department, and they'll have an anthropology department, et cetera, et cetera. They have these departments. Mm. The, the Muslim mind was like that. Like we had these multiple yeah. departments engaging with each other all within the Islamic studies, right? Yeah. And then we just kind of said, no, everything else is dunya and we just exactly. want to study deen. And yeah. this is indeed, this is actually, in my mind, I'll come out and say it, that is 
to me, the definition of secularism. Secularism mm-hmm. is when you separate religion from all else. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, they say we separate all else from religion. Mm-hmm. Well, you're doing the exact same thing from the other side. You're saying, I'm going to separate religion from mm-hmm. everything else. All else. Yeah, that's, yeah. Just, that's just as secular. <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. what they find problematic is actually what, in some sense, what any reasonable person would also find Problematic on top of, of course, the propaganda is that the the content of the religion itself is poisonous mm, and mm. all that stuff, right? But on on uh, on a social level, this is actually a, a tough reality to contend with. Yeah, and know? like since you actually found like somewhat of a, an empathetic approach to that sentiment, did you find like a way to actually like navigate it in house in a way? Yeah, yeah. So I because it's firsthand, right? My parents had that sentiment, oh. and my my parents thought that I'm just gonna. Abandoned my education and leave everything behind and all that's that. when you found and the MSA kind of thing or that's when I first found the MSA That's when, oh. they, when they first started seeing some sprinkles of hairs <laughs> that I could only go three twigs and I was growing them. Yeah, you know uh, <laughs> For the longest time I had long sideburns and nothing else like this was <laughs> I look like a, a bad uh, Replica of like Pulp Fiction or something <laughs> like, that's what I like. But <laughs> That was my MSA look but anyway, yeah. um what I figured out very quickly is that if you're excelling professionally mm-hmm. while <laughs> holding on to your religion, that creates the biggest confusion of their lives. They don't know how to deal with it because their whole problem mm-hmm. was mm-hmm. the more religious you become, the mm-hmm. least successful you'll be. Mm-hmm. Right? So now if you're excelling in your studies and you're excelling in your career and you're mm-hmm. excelling at like you're you're leaving other people behind in every one of these boxes mm. and yet you're holding on to your religion then they start thinking either he doesn't understand the religion or i didn't understand <laughs> it. somebody's confused yeah, <laughs> that's right right yeah so then the next thing they'll do to cope <clears throat> is they'll try to attack the religion because they're trying to figure out where you stand they can't make sense of it mm. Mm. and that's when you have an opportunity to intelligently present the religion for the first time instead of being mm-hmm. defensive and what that does is it, it does wonders and i think a, a, a remarkable renaissance and reform will happen in the muslim world when middle class and beyond professionals mm-hmm. business people students etc they start embodying islamic principles while living while succeeding mm-hmm. as members contributing members of society mm-hmm. Right when that when those two things start happening together, it's an unbeatable force. In fact, then people will say these people are more successful, more principled. Mm. They're better to do business with. They're the better hire. They're the better students because they're more principled. I've never had a college student who, you know, uh, hurt someone or hazed someone or got drunk and got in an accident or whatever because they're Muslim mm. or whatever. Right? That it'll set us in a different standard. That's what I think. But anyway, so, so go ahead and tell me. So hmm. you were hiding from your parents going to the masjid, which is cool. <laughs> I've hidden from my parents, but not gone to the masjid. <laughs> yeah. So, and I listened to a lot of your lectures as well, like family wise, like how to deal and all. <clears throat> really? It wasn't that bad. So I don't want to give the wrong picture of my family. And right, all, right, but right. still, they were like, like, don't get in too much into religion and all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I was doing a lot of stuff without telling them. <laughs> like, this wise. Yo, Did you get married without telling them? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> the main part, uh, just like I mentioned right now, so I started kind of doing well in my studies and in my job as well. Mm. So I got hired in a company, so I started doing well as a... I'm a software engineer right now, so which I started like a years back. So that's what... Uh, draw the line. Like, you can be a successful person while holding on to your religion and that's really proved the point that's why when you say it i'm like that's 100 percent correct yeah Mm. Yeah. has your relationship has your family's relationship with islam changed at all uh it did but not because of me but they also found like they were not super totally against it they were still muslims it was just cautious uh yeah so now (laughs) later on when things change but now everyone's happy alhamdulillah like we're all good so alhamdulillah that's that's pretty amazing (laughs) what about yourself what's your relationship with this religion growing up no so growing up actually it's all on you it's it's what? it's yeah i mean yeah we, we there was a lot of studies yeah, like we studied like we studied like physics chemistry biology all of it we studied all of it but like in in in, in our schools there was like 
we had a separate class for fiqh, and there's hadith, there's tafsir, uh, there's tajweed, and there's uh, Quran, tawheed, and uh, there's like half Quran too. Wow, that's a lot of classes. That's amazing. Oh, yeah, no, we had like 17 subjects. Like, we didn't get to choose. We had like 16, 17 subjects that we had to take, and we'd like get tested on all of them. But then, uh, yeah. And uh, this is basically kind of just like the way of life. It's kind of like being, this is just how everybody lives. This is how everybody thought. And then uh, that's when like I came to the United States with that thought, really. And then come to like the culture shock was real. The culture shock was really, really, uh, there was a lot of adjustment to make. And that, there was one particular year, I think it was like 2013, I was taking, uh, so I didn't have like any Muslim friends. Like didn't have any Muslim friends. All my friends were basically either atheists or Christian. And then uh, I was uh, I was in one semester in school. I was taking world religions, and I was taking philosophy. And one of my closest friends, he's actually one of my closer friends to this day. He was Christian, and him and I would engage in dialogues about religion, but not in a matter of which I'm trying to convince you or you're trying to convince me. Right. It's more of like an open discussion of mm. what different religions thought. We'd just open up a thought, and you're like, oh, in Islam we think this, and in Christianity we think that. And... Uh, during that semester when I was taking these classes and I was getting exposed to all this, specifically in philosophy, you're forced to think in ways that you're never really taught to think. Correct. Back home. Yeah. So you're those to answer questions you never even thought of. Exactly. Okay, how do you prove there there's existence of God? And in my mind I'm like, what do you mean there's like how can how can the world exist without God? Like actually giving me so having to actually write a paper on the existence of God, that was kind of like, I was kind of like mind struck, like what do I even write? Like my paper was blank for about a week. It was like, I didn't even know what to write. Oh. Yeah, so it was just a lot of these thoughts that were, um, that were introduced, they're very new to me. I did not know how to navigate them at all. And because I didn't know these answers, that I started having, I started having like some doubts and I'm like, okay, I need to know, like, why is it? Like, especially like in world religions, everybody, like there were these religions from like these Native American religions. There was Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Confucius, all of them. And uh, they were like actually a good mixture in my classroom where people were... Representing different religions. Yeah, representing different religions. And uh, I would look around and like everyone had that unwavering conviction that... Yeah, right. yeah, we're right. But then couple that with that philosophy class i'm like okay if i was to actually like engage in a conversation with one especially like some of like my 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 christian friends i was talking to i came to realize that they were taught christianity the exact same way i was taught islam mm. so he, exactly so i was like okay i if i was to come up with a reason for that i had no idea so in in and uh, i remember to this day my friend asked me that one question that kind of my parents actually never like my family doesn't know about what I'm talking right right now, so it's going to be a shock to them. Nobody actually knew, but at this point, one of my friends asked me one question that kind of just shattered my faith, and he was like, "Deep down, you know who you are better than like anyone. Like deep down, when you're on your own, you're on your alone in your thoughts, you know who you are. If you have grown, if you had grown up in a Christian family, or a Hindu family, or a Buddhist family, would you have left it for Islam? Would you have left your entire?" circle your entire family your entire thought everything that you grew up with for islam and thinking about that i'm a little like no I, if i was to like change everything i was if i was to actually imagine the thought that i grew up in a uh, the same way that they grew up in a christian like i don't know if i know enough about islam for me to say i would actually make the move so that's when i was like okay i need to i need why to start I actually what I believe. exactly i need to actually answer the why behind everything that i'm doing yeah and um there was a that kind of like bled into 2014 and there was a period of months that where I did absolutely nothing but research Islam research religions and research everything and um, well to this day I don't remember exactly how I, I have no recollection of that memory but I was working on a project it was like a final project that I had and uh, I was so I, uh, I took a lot of notes on my phone uh, during classes during conversations with professors I was just I found it easy to pick up my phone and put in some notes so I was working on that project and uh, I was like yeah I remember taking notes about this project that would help me so I opened up my phone I was scrolling through it one of the notes had no subject had no context had nothing it just had divine speech <laughs> and uh, I was like that was divine speech like I don't know I like have no recollection of how that got to my phone I've 
to this day, well, I have no idea how that got to my phone. And uh, I just Googled divine speech. And there was like these two videos on YouTube. And uh, I think it was around like 8 p.m. The project was due at like at midnight, at noon, like at midnight, 11.59. And uh, I started watching these two videos and just that bled into just watching like Islamic videos after these two videos to like 4 a.m. in the morning, it blew off the project, blew off everything, I was just listening to lectures. And that's when I delved very like head down deep into just researching Islam. And that was like, kind of like the tipping point that made me feel like, okay, now I believe the Quran, now I have my why. Now I believe the Quran is actually the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If I was actually to think about how the Quran is actually a miracle, now I have my answers. And that's actually how it, how it turned out. And actually that kind of, that period of time, it was actually funny because like I was really like delving deep into it. But in my feel like my parents were very supportive of the fact when I would come and tell them like, hey, listen to this. This is what I found out. This is what I learned. But my brothers, however, where that was like the subject of making fun of. So like they'd be playing like PlayStation or FIFA or something. And they were like, hey, Anna, come join us. And I'd be like listening to a lecture. I'm like, we'll play a lecture, Islamic lecture for you here if you just join us. So kind of thing. They were just kind of, that's uh this is how it kind of like was for a long period of time. But then right now, alhamdulillah, like every kind of like shifted and started listening to the same thing too, so. You know, I'm, I'm wondering, because mm. I think the one on YouTube is from me when I spoke at City College. I think it, it's very old. It was very, very old. It was kind of very dark themed. Yes, uh, like very City College in New York. Yeah. And um, that was the first time I spoke about divine speech. Yeah. I had no idea who you were, honestly. I no, just. I'm uh, not sure if I knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah. know, my thoughts on yeah. that subject is it was interesting. I was talking to a couple of uh, young men uh, last week. They were visiting here. They, they've all done their PhDs in Islamic studies mm. out of Harvard. Mm. Brilliant young guys. And uh, they're all heading their own ways. And they stopped by Dallas to meet with some people. And they wanted to meet with me. So we had dinner. We talked. And we were talking about divine speech. Mm. And one of the things that I, I mentioned at the time was that when I first started studying the Quran, my attitude was, oh, here's what makes it divine. Then I learned to humble myself over time to that statement. Mm. And that, I'll give you an analogy. If, yeah. I, if I dove into the ocean and I pulled out a pearl, mm -hmm. I wouldn't say, I have found <coughs> the ocean's treasure. I yeah. wouldn't say that. I would say... I found a treasure that I find priceless. Yeah. But I cannot speak on behalf of the entire ocean. Yeah. When I'm holding this one pearl. Yeah. But I can say that this is pretty valuable to me, right? Yeah. And that that's what divine speech became to me. Like here's what I every time I discover this, mm -hmm. to me this is miraculous. I can't speak for anyone else. Well, maybe they don't see the pearl from the same angle that I do. Mm. Maybe they see it from a distance, like it's just holding a rock. Is that kind of what kind of led to the evolve, like the how divine speech evolved from these two lectures into these like thirteen lectures up on Bain? And then a book, and then and the book, like, yeah. and even those thirteen <coughs> lectures were a summary. They were a thirty-nine page version of just a list of ayat. What used to be a sixty-five page document. Mm. So I only taught two thirds of it ever, um, and then. Heavenly order was a byproduct of that, mm. I did, you know, on the, on the sequence of the Quran. Yeah. Um, and now that I'm actually full time studying Quran, like mm. I'm just that's what I'm doing with my yeah. life. Now I see reasons for the Quran being divine in a completely new <laughs> way that I didn't see those years ago. Yeah. Right. And it's 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 completely enhanced or it continues to evolve my view, mm. which makes me humble myself to the Quran every single month, literally every month. You were at one of the Quran weeks, weren't you? In Minneapolis, Florida? yeah. Uh, Surat Al-Qamar. Uh, Surat, uh, Surat Al-Hadid in Minneapolis. Um, you were in Minneapolis? Yes. Weren't you in Florida too? I was not in Florida, no. You were in Minneapolis? Minneapolis, yeah. <laughs> I'm so bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, actually, I was actually just I was just joking. I would be very surprised given how many people you meet worldwide if you had actually remembered. Actually, there was one time I actually <laughs> ran into you in uh, in uh, DFW. In where? The airport. Yeah, in the airport. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's when I like ran to the airport. I'm like, oh wow, yeah. When you when you kind of sort of recognize me, like, oh, wow, 
what a memory, mashallah. <laughs> it's like you're recognized. I remember you were doing like combat sports. Yeah, yeah, doing, yeah. Yes, yeah, I remember. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not that bad. I'm not entirely yeah, senile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's actually one of the things that actually my parents were very strict about growing up is that they, uh, they, they were very strict on um, uh, religion, uh, studies, and martial arts. So my brothers and I, if, if we don't do our studies or if we don't do our prayers or if we don't do our martial arts, then like we don't get to go out and play or we don't get to see our friends. Or wow. We don't get to do like what fun things Some we wanted cool to do. Some cool parenting policy. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, what kind of martial arts do you do? Uh, I did Taekwondo for, um, for almost 10 years. And now, um, now I do more like Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, like uh, grappling, uh, martial arts. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So divine speech for you. Yeah. Divine speech. And you were talking about those videos you used to watch in Uzbekistan that were about parenting. <coughs> That's nice. You have an al allergy or something? No, I got cold like a week ago. So I oh. was good. I didn't cough the whole morning. Just now I just started, I was Barely holding it back, but I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry okay, about cough that. away. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't hold back. Huh. So after coming to the U.S., yeah. uh, the first time I just got to hang out with my friend to New York City, just to walk around like first year in New York. And we got to the New York University MSA. Oh, we just yeah, looked at yeah, the yeah. Master of the World to pray. Yeah, it's a nice spot. <clears throat> yeah. So we were praying, and we just met the brother there. I don't remember his name. It was like a, eight years ago. He said, like, you guys know Noman and Khan? I'm like, yeah, I've watched a couple of his videos. He's like, he's coming to the story night in next week or something. I was like, oh, that's cool. Let's do it. So now on the spot, we bought the tickets, <coughs> and I got the number off your brother. So we emailed back and forth, and I volunteered at the event as well. You did. <coughs> So I remember when the people are walking in, my job was just was to that check their Union? tickets. Huh? Was that the one at Cooper Union? I don't remember the spot, but... It was an auditorium, right? Yeah. With yeah. pillars? It was about the Musa, like Yeah, being it was Cooper thrown. Union. Yeah. Yes. And when you were walking in, I see you, like, where's your ticket? I asked you for your ticket. I, 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 on, on purpose, as a joke. You, I don't remember what you answered. But that's when the first time I heard the story of Musa in completely different perspective. I knew the story of Adam alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, just very, very basic. That's what I've been yeah. studying my whole years. And now like, oh, this is how the Quran taught, the way you explained right. that the Quran says mm -hmm. the story that, yeah. wow. And that's when like, I started getting into it, like by, you know, subscription and all. We took a lot of pictures with you afterwards, but I lost that phone. <laughs> <laughs> all the memories are gone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that reminds me of it. New York show. I gave um, two years ago. I was in New York giving the Eid Khutbah. Okay, it was downtown New York. Mm. I give the Eid Khutbah. People are coming, giving me hugs, <coughs> and arms, all that stuff. This one guy is just staring at me. I just he's giving me the mug. He's just this bombastic side eye the whole time. <laughs> and then he, when people are kind of done, he comes to me and goes, "I don't know you. I don't even know if I like you." But a lot of people want to take a picture with you. Can I take a picture with you? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love the authenticity. <laughs> yeah. So you Subhanallah. attended a story night. I remember which story night that was. Which, that was which part of? Yeah, which part of? That was from Surah Al Qasas. That's Surah Al Qasas. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young and courageous. Mm. I remember. The early life of Musa right, on, yeah. And that's when you really explain like about men getting married. The that's guy right, called the you end. like, go get the baby bottle and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh that my God, you remember that joke? Yeah, of course. Like <laughs> That was like, yeah, I got to be the man now. I was very young. I was 18 or 19. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't very young, but not mature Ooh, that, enough. That was, a, like, that was a good one. That helps. Like, <clears throat> that I think that motivated a lot of people as well, like oh, youngsters. Man, I should tell that joke to you guys. Yeah. You know it. I do. I don't know if you're, you wouldn't know it. Yeah, I, would, I, I think I think I heard it very Tell it. Yeah. So I was like, uh, okay, I don't want to butcher it, but I was like, <laughs> so, you know, now you have guys that will come up and say, I, li I like this girl, I want to marry her, I've been talking to her, how long have you been talking to her? Uh, three years, but I'm not sure if I should, uh, you know, I'm not sure if I'm ready to get married, or I'm not sure if I can talk to the family. Three, what if after they say, three years? What if they, yeah, what if they say no? You get this all the time. Okay. And I'm like, oh, I have a, I have a brother, what should I do? I'm like, I have a, I have a solution. Go to the local pharmacy. <laughs> If you go to the infant section, they have this baby formula <laughs> and get yourself a small bottle 
and you, you have to get like so it needs to be a little bit warmer than room temperature you shake it really well you stick the thing on top you go sit in a corner and suck on that <laughs> bottle because you're a baby you're not a man and when you become a man then you can go talk to the family <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> it's a joke but really touch a lot of people like yeah, it works yeah it works you still remember. <laughs> this was this is a classic <laughs> And alhamdulillah, yeah, within yeah. two years, I guess, I went to my father, like, I want to get married. <laughs> nice. After getting a job and all this stuff. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> like, straight. <laughs> nice. Yeah. We, I think because of that. Okay, got through. <laughs> I got, I got through. <laughs> yeah, that's phenomenal. Yes. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So what are you guys up to nowadays? Um, so I'm actually in consulting right now. It's actually, uh, given, given by the amount of lectures I've heard from you, it's your favorite, favorite, um, field of study. Uh, it's accounting. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> Isn't it software engineering? That's why you do combat sports to release. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. You, you want to debit somebody's <laughs> credit. <laughs> actually, it's funny you say that. Cause like, uh, and, and some of the meetings that I've had with some of my colleagues are like, why do you do martial arts? I'm like, it's the only way to balance out the life that I'm having here. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, but it's, but we say that jokingly, no, it's actually, it's a great place that I'm in. That's, That's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm a software engineer. Uh, <coughs> what kind of stuff company. are you developing? Uh, mostly full stack. It's for the financial company. We do I see. Front end, back end database, and all that kind of stuff. You're the heavy hitter, full stack. And uh, yeah, didn't yeah. you do software engineering? I was. Then I made Toba. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> now I have. Uh, <laughs> with Bayina, it's it's kind of almost a tech company, mm -hmm. almost because mm -hmm. we have a lot mm -hmm. of tech issues and mm -hmm. you know the app and all of that stuff um so i deal with engineers and mm. we have a company we work with and they're out in kosovo actually oh yeah so i i go to kosovo a few times we're good friends out there mm. uzbekistan is a place i've been wanting to go actually oh but but perfect <laughs> it would be pretty cool i don't know if i tell anybody i just show up and just let people give me the look like yeah, a lot of people know you so when people know me and they see me walk by Here's what happens. The, the, the person who wants to, like who hates you and wants to almost attack you has the same look as the person who almost recognizes you. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. So they're looking at you like. <laughs> and I'm thinking, should I be, should I be ready? <laughs> and then within a split second. Are you? <laughs> but the original look is just as yeah. dangerous. <laughs> and I look back and he's still doing the scan. I'm, like, okay, I'm just going to let this be. I'm just, I need to become a stoic and let it happen. <laughs> yeah, around two years ago, I made a YouTube video on my own about the Bayina.com. Oh, you did? Okay. In my language. Like, hey, guys, want to study Arabic or lecture? Is Bayina. You can go and subscribe and all. And after that, I did see that, you know, when you go to you know, the subscription page, it's yeah. going to show you numbers, like how many people are waiting for yeah. subscription. Uzbekistan just really grew. It was like 20, 30, I guess. Yeah. So I hope because of that, a lot of people get wow, to know now, mashallah. like a lot of people. Mm. <laughs> mashallah. Yeah. How's English comprehension in Uzbekistan? Say it again? How's English comprehension in Uzbekistan? Oh, very good nowadays. Almost, oh. almost everyone speaks English. The wow. youngsters, not the older people. You know, one of, my, one of my hopes now with, you know, with the way AI is you know moving at light speed oh, um, yeah. is that you know I always wondered if I can get my durus because it's been now 20 almost 24 years 25 years that mm. I've been trying to study Quran comment on the Quran um, and uh, inshallah another 12-15 years to go before I can complete my work mm. at least that phase of the work but whatever's been done so far I was I was thinking man if I just learned another language and I tried to do this over again in another mm. language it would take me another 25 yeah, 20 years. years yeah 20 years like it's this is too much work yeah well and now now i'm thinking if ai could be trained enough to do it in my voice in uzbeki oh, and yeah. farsi and you know in Punjabi. i think there are already like ways to do that there is because it's multilingual right yeah. so i'm speaking in arabic sometimes throwing in some stupid mm -hmm. joke mm -hmm. or whatever yeah, yeah so yeah, if yeah. the ai model can be trained to because there's only so much range i have yeah right i come back to the same things as any human being does mm that if it can be trained i think it can be produced mm -hmm. and then because to me it's not just getting my work produced the the point to me is the 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 quran is missing 
from our discourse. Like Islamic discourse is about all things mm. with a touch of the Quran, like a reference to the Quran. It's not Quran discourse. Mm -hmm. The Quran is not our conversation. Mm. Yeah. You know? And I want the Quran not to replace those conversations, but at least be as much a conversation as all, all else. You know, this is the thing that created the civilization. This, mm, <laughs> this book, yeah. and now it's just become like a referential tool, right? And so, is that why you kind of find that book that you referenced with Al-Fakar uh, as like fascinating? Is he kind of like touching upon the fact that how it was very there was no, a Quranic he, discourse? That was it. that was not the reason. I, uh, I I I become more fascinated, more and more fascinated with two things. Um, the history of the last 400 years hmm. and li history of the first 100 years. Of That's very specific. It's ve it is very specific, yeah. So the, the last 400 years helps me understand much more deeply wh why, we're, why we are where we are, hmm. not just politically and socially, but also intellectually. Hmm. Why are Muslims, even Muslim scholarship? Hmm. Like when I think of, when I went to a visit a, a madrasa in Pakistan and they were using a certain curriculum for their madrasa, yeah. These 400 years helped me understand how did that curriculum get developed? How did it come here? How did it evolve? How did it end up in this mother sign? What is it producing now? Mm. Right? There's a context mm. to why things are the way they are. Yeah. Right? And what we often do in our study of history, these last 400 years, the most recent 400 years, is we separate the Islamic history, Islamic scholarly history, mm. from the political history. We as, the, as though they're two separate subjects. Islam, religion and politics are never separate. Mm. They're never separate. The, the state or forces or money is always involved in what becomes the dominant nar narrative mm. or what is allowed to survive as the narrative, right? So yeah. a state-sanctioned religion is part of our history. And protest against that and voices that were raised against that is also a part of our history. It's not just, oh, you know, the church that did it or the, you know, ancient Jews that did it. No, Muslims yeah. did it too. Muslims have done it too. And they don't just do it now. You, you know when it's happening now. Yeah. It's clear as day. But we think it's just happening now. No, no, no. This has been happening for some oh. centuries. And if you don't understand that, then you can't really honestly look at the scholarship because you're looking at it in isolation from other influences yeah. and other forces, right? So that's that's one one of my fascinations. The other is, of course, the first hundred years, which I'll just give you one question. Yeah, that's still unanswered for me. Um, I became very interested in the subject of riba, and um, I still don't have answers on that subject. It's still questions right now, and I'm exploring. And one of the things I really wanted to explore in depth is well, Islam spread, and we got to the Roman Empire, we got to the Persian Empire, we got to the Abyssinians, and mm. you know the. So, so we're, we're taking over all these lands and now we're implementing Sharia, which means we're prohibiting riba. Yeah. So my question is, when we get to the Byzantine Empire, what did riba look like before we got there? And what did removing riba look like after we came? Like, how did the economic structure change? Like, how are we operating? Right? We have so many theoretical discussions about these subjects. Hmm. And we have anecdotal stories from like our Sira tradition, like hmm. one or two glimpses of this yeah. stuff. But we're not just the Sira and now. We're, there's an entire <coughs> civilization yeah. that was built. How did they implement it? And I'm today years old and I don't know. Was there like a lot of actually references to go back to that would actually delve into that detail? That's in what I'm, I'm still in the dark right now. I'm trying to speak with some historians about where I can find more of this. Yeah. And maybe some people have done work on this and just in my ignorance. Because yeah. this is a relatively new curiosity that yeah. I have. So I don't even know actually where to begin. Yeah, because actually that makes me curious because just recently I was actually studying the uh, the history of how the Muslims actually took over Constantinople. Yeah. And uh, see, that's yeah. Middle Islam now. Yeah, that's mm. that's very Middle Islam. But you said Byzantine Empire, and yeah. basically that's that's when the Byzantine Empire actually came to an end, is because right. when the when Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih actually took the city and he actually just changed it dramatically, such in 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 like insanely fast, the changes to, took over. Yeah. And uh, how like there was. Um, 
I'm not sure about the economical situation of the Byzantine Empire, but they dealt with a lot of gold, and specifically before the uh, the conquest of Constantinople. And uh, Constantine had to actually take a lot of the monuments in the churches and everything and had to burn it down and mine it into to coins. Mine the, to mine the gold. To mine the gold, exactly. So... But right now, actually, like one of the historians that I uh, that I saw, he actually like held like one of the one of the coins, and he it was like little like it didn't have any engravings on it. It was just little copper, even it was not even gold. So it was kind of like in a dire situation, almost like economically. Wow. So, yeah, I, I'd have to actually remember. Like I think he's like to this day he's in, he's in Massachusetts. If you're ever like in the in the East Coast area. I mean, I hate the Celtics. <laughs> <laughs> but I must admit, they're a superior team, and we, yeah. we got we got we got crushed. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, it was, it was like it was like watching a high school team play a college, like varsity, like team. It was it was, yeah, it's painful. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so I'll take my time going to Massachusetts. <laughs> I'll fly in from a different city. I won't fly in from Dallas. I'll fly in from like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was really nice talking to you guys. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Um, I, I want to sort of ask you now, mm. going forward, like, you've been exposed to my work, I think, to a, a decent extent. Um, what is it that you think about this work that we're trying to do as Bayina? has impacted your relationship with the Qur'an particularly? Because you're Muslims already. You already knew mm. about the Qur'an. You already probably read some translation or heard. Those. What is it that sets it, brings some sort of value to this work for you guys? I want to know. Yeah, uh, yeah. so um, at least for me, um, ever since I was like 16 or 17, I've been delving into it. Like, I read a lot of books. Um, I'm, not, I'm not on social media at all. Mm. Um, I, I, uh, I think... I don't do uh, I don't spend much time on my phone either I just like to spend a lot of time either like I don't know listen to lectures or, but I read a lot of books and particularly the I like to refer to books as um, I don't I don't want to call them self-help books but more like self-improvement and how kind of basically how to always optimize how to actually go about it the best way uh, particularly in the areas of psychology and sociology and uh I've always at least thought, like, believe, you know, the Qur'an basically has the answers for everything, but I didn't know how to actually navigate it and know how to actually go about it. Extract those answers. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, because there were many times I would read books, and then I would remember, like, I would read, uh, like, a particular part of a paragraph of a book. I'm like, oh, yeah, actually, I think that I actually just basically describes what this book has been talking about for an entire chapter. It's just that entire chapter is just really just in that one ayah kind of thing, like... In Namal Usri Yusra, in Namal Usri Yusra, basically. That, like that book, when I read uh, The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday, basically that entire book is basically stoicism. And it, it delves into a lot of details, but when I read In Namal Usri Yusra, in Namal Usri Yusra, basically The Obstacle is the Way in Namal Usri Yusra. So, um, mm. so that's. So I've always known, basically, the Qur'an basically has the answers. Every book I've ever, re- I've ever read, basically, I know in a, in a way the Qur'an has touched upon it. But I, uh, going specifically, when I went through Qur'an week and sort of the Hadid, um, alhamdulillah, I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful. Hadid was quite an experience. Yes, yeah. it was, it was like, sort of the Hadid was mind-blowing, honestly. Yeah. And uh, that, that really set the foundation for me as to how I can actually go back to the Quran and how can I read, especially like you give out the booklets and how, what is the blueprint of actually when you're reading the Quran, what is the thought process and what are some of the answers they should be looking forward to that would help you extract those answers. Right. So that approach in of itself kind of made me like, okay, now I can refer back to the Quran in a way that would. I did so many surahs and I was so I always had a fascination with Surah Al Hadid, but I didn't get to dive in it the way I did when, in that Quran week. Yeah, and uh, this was a couple of months before my son was born, and yeah. uh, I named him Hadid. Really? <laughs> yeah, his name's Hadid. Oh, mashallah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my my mother in law heard. So, what are you studying? And I was like, I'm preparing for Surah Al Hadid. She goes, We should name the baby that. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> Wow. You're right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so he's Hadid Norman Ali Khan. <laughs> oh, actually, I love that name. Actually, Hadid. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, what was it about Surah Hadid in specific that kind of made you, or was it, I don't know if there was one thing because of the so entire... it's it's several things. Yeah. It's, it's um, my late teacher, uh, Doctor Asar Ahmed. Uh. Uh, he th- he 
purported that Surah Al Asr summarizes the entire Quran, mm. and if Surah Al Asr was a flower or, or a seed, then it blooms into a flower, and that yeah. flower is Surah Al Hadid. And he he demonstrated that, like wow. everything in Surah Al Asr gets elaborated mm. and opened up in Surah Al Hadid. Um, it's the opening of that surah and the way that Allah is talked about in the opening of that surah is yeah. not found anywhere else in, yeah. in the entire Quran. Um, the way that Allah has tied um, the the philosophical and the, the metaphysical underpinnings of our religion with the mission of this religion. Hmm. So there's, you know, put it in the most simple terms, there's, you know, you live in your head. How do you see the world in your head? And what kind of life do you lead? Mm. Like, what is driving you to lead your life? And both of those things are so beautifully fused together in the surah. Mm. Like, it's it it, yeah. it really does it does something that I don't know if any other surah does in the way that it does it. Yeah, you know? actually, it's funny. Actually, you mentioned that because that particular part is the one that really just kind of blew me away. Because particularly right now, actually, I got in. Um, I met a, a, like a new group of people that I've been hanging out with. Mm. And uh, they're they're very much into the thought that whatever you think about, you will end up seeing at some point in your life. So like, like manifesting just, or something. Yeah, they they call it manifestation kind of thing. So it just kind of keep like watch your thoughts and basically the story that you tell yourself inside because whatever it is that goes inside your head, basically at some point you're going to be seeing. And uh, I've always thought there was a, a little bit of a, a kink in the armor of that of that argument. But I know there's maybe some truth to it, but I didn't know how. So I was wondering how can we tie that to the Quran? Whereas I mentioned the Quran, so when I listened to Surah Al Hadid, I was mind blown. I'm like, okay, now I got my answers. Now this is it. Now I was like reading Surah Al Hadid over and over. My mom actually just last week asked me like, my mom goes like through like surahs and like uh, she wants to memorize like the Quran as much as possible. And she's like, what surah should I go? I'm like, go for Surah Al Hadid. Go for Surah Al Hadid. <laughs> it's 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 amazing. Like it's so. Yeah. Allah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually really baffled right now. I'm. I, I've. I've been stressed with every surah that I've covered, mm. but this is a new level of stress right now. Surah Hadid. No, not right now. Right now. So, surah Saf. Surah Saf. Yeah. Why? I've took. I've taken more time off to prep for Surah Saf than any other surah in all of the Quran weeks that I started from since Surah Dariyat. It's two surahs that I knew were going to take me, like they they were going to drain my brain juice. <laughs> And we're going to be Hadid and Hashar. Not Hadid, uh, um, Saf and Hashar. The three used to be Hadid, Saf and Hashar. But yeah. Alhamdulillah, those are done. Yeah. But Saf, man. is a beast. Huh? It's, there's so much to do, ya Allah. I'm all like... <laughs> what are you, is, are you like I'm extracting? Overwhelmed. I, gave, I gave the research team, because we study together as a team. Yeah. I gave them like, here's what we're going to work on. And they're all like... Yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Like, Did you yeah. like extract so many, like a lot of information out of it? A lot of like treasures, as we called it, beginning of this conversation, and you kind of have, <laughs> to, have, it, have to choose they're... like a path, or how does it go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's the, the this surah. It, po- it, it it demonstrates the mission of the Prophet Sallallahu in the most explicit terms, and it's easy to just read that and move on. Yeah, and it's not easy to stop and contemplate it. It leads to some very goes that you gonna go down a rabbit hole of questions and mm. exploration, mm. and I'm doing that currently. Um, it's it's made me revisit things I was studying 20 years ago. <laughs> and wow. Going over them, recounting them, um, revisiting conclusions I thought I had reached five years ago. I have to rethink them, so it's like a cataclysmic shift in my head right now going on because I'm like just giving myself to Surah Al-Hadid. <laughs> wow. What's the stuff you mean? Huh? So oh, sorry, so I keep saying Hadid. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Surah Al-Saf. Yeah. Yeah. Surah yeah. Wait, do you have a deadline for it? Is it supposed to be done? Well, I'm supposed to teach it in Michigan. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, it's, it's coming up. Uh, yeah. Early, Michigan, so it's early 29th. Early, 29th, isn't it? June 29th, isn't it? Is it? Oh, God. I have no time. No, I think it's it's a little later than that. A little later than yeah, that, yeah. And you're coming to Maryland in July for the story night. That's right. Yeah. We'll see you there, inshallah. And that's when you thought you knew the story of Adam, alayhi salam. Yeah. Gonna, yeah. Yeah, you're going to 
teach is, something. So when, when you do story nights, do they change from one to another? Do you do them? Uh, I, I develop one. Yeah. Then I tour the world with it. Okay. For about a year and a half. Yeah. And then I retire that one. Then I take six months to recover from doing story nights. And then think of another one. So there were there were two that I was thinking about. The one currently, that I'm, I usually don't give away what I'm doing, but mm. um, I thought when I studied, I re-studied the story of Adam alayhi salam in the Quran. Mm. And I am now convinced that it is the first priority for every Muslim and actually every human being to mm. know this story before they know anything else. They, Adam. It's not just first chronologically, it's yeah. first in priority. It's th that's why it's the first story told in the Mus'haf. There's a reason it's the first. Mm -hmm. And now, now, I'm, now I'm seeing the reason. Why is this the first? And everything else we're learning, well, to put it the most simply, why are we on this planet? <laughs> right? I need a deep answer to that question. Why are mm. we here? That question is the story of Adam. <clears throat> that's how we got here. And that's and that's in something that you're developing. That's that answer is I've not. I developed in the, it. You developed it. I developed it. It's not on Bayina though. No, not yet. No, not I in the way you... that I'm not in the way that I'm doing it now. I've done some some stuff on the story of Adam mm. but not this way. Okay. And Decided. this is this yeah. is to me. It's the most known story in the world. Some version of this is known by everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The book of Genesis has it. The rabbinical tradition has it. The Christians have their own reading of it. Yeah. Right? So there's at least three versions of the story floating around already before the Quran even enters the picture. Mm. The, the biblical version, the Jewish version, the Christian version. I kind of want to ask you, <laughs> what is the answer you could... <laughs> Come to start. <laughs> 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 but I... Bayo. Yeah, it, it got me thinking even about Islamic education, like kids' mm. education. Like, mm. there's a point where we need to form the identity of a child. And when you think about identity, the first definition of identity is affiliation, to me, mm. practically speaking, not subconscious, at the subconscious level. At, at a conscious level, as a child is developing, their first sense of, like, self comes from self, sense of belonging. Mm. So if they don't see Baba or Mama, they get a little nervous, right? Or they, or even if they're comfortable with it. my kid's very social. Mm. This, this latest one, he'll go to anybody. He'll Hadid? give anybody a smile. Yeah, he'll just <laughs> Hadid is just like he's, mashallah. So, yeah. but if he sees me even from a distance, the way he sings and dances, mm. this is ten months old, ten and a half months old. You're like, ah, like he'll go crazy, <laughs> right? Yeah, because there's a there's a bond between mm. us. Mm. Yeah, and that's actually become a part of his identity. Mm. He's learning language from his parents. Right? Yeah. He's getting his genetics from his parents. He's getting his like his habits from his parents. Yeah. His parents are an extension of, if not the formulating part of his identity. Now think about that for a moment. Parents are a core part of your identity, right? Both physically and psychologically and socially. In every yeah. way, right? Now take that back. Who's our parent? Adam. Adam. Like if you don't know your parent, then you don't really know you. <laughs> So does it kind of does it kind of like at some point tell you where we kind of diverted? Is it gonna like have to go back to the source to make it to make things right, kind of thing? Or okay, yeah, it's uh, juicy. Know. It's juicy. Yeah, I'll give you one clue though. Okay, the way Allah talks about Adam, mm. in Surah nice. Al Baqarah, mm. it, some of that is also the way He talks about the Israelites. In the same surah, mm. same language. Well, uh, it's very perplexing. It's, it's confusing. What? Why would he talk about them with this same yeah. phrase that was here? Right? It's mind blowing stuff. Okay, I'm, 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 yeah, I'm trying to not to ask a lot of a lot more questions. I know. <laughs> I want to create those questions in your head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're doing. You're doing hell of a. That's it's working. <laughs> <laughs> that's my job is to get people to start develop an itch in their brain to get them to go and explore yeah, <laughs> yeah, inshallah. That's right. yeah inshallah but yeah I mean, I mean I'm hoping that you guys inshallah become um, it, it's interesting you come from very different backgrounds you're you're coming from a background where religion was not really a part of your mm. life yeah. and you have to hide from your parents to, to learn the Quran 
or learn anything about Islam. And you're mm-hmm. getting a full on 17 classes a day. <laughs> in Islam. Yeah. And six, seven of those classes are Islam. Yeah. <laughs> education. <laughs> and yet you're finding yourselves kind of, you, you, you discovered, I think your first exposure was story night, real, real exposure. Indeed. Yeah. Right. For the Quran. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Which is also, to me, it's, it's two different things. The, what Story Night does is, my objective of Story Night was, somebody hears that and says, wow, the Quran talks to me. These stories are alive. Mm. Right? There's this personalized yeah. connection. And the purpose of divine speech was, wow, it's, that is from God. <laughs> yeah. That can't be human. <laughs> you know? well, those are two equally important things. Because yeah. one of them is kind of intellectual. Yeah. Right? Okay, now I'm convinced it's divine. But that doesn't mean that I connect with it deeply, yeah. emotionally. But the stories, yeah, they're yeah. they're yeah. so subhanallah. Yeah. You guys came to, to full circle, full actually. circle in yeah. a really interesting way. <laughs> yeah. Mashallah. No, it's actually mashallah. funny because like when I was growing up, and we'd hear all these stories. So there was a lot of emphasis on uh, tarikh, on history. Yeah. And there was you know there was like the story of Umar al Khattab when he was hiding between the cloth of the Kaaba and Muhammad alayhi salatu was salam like in, in with ill intentions. And he heard them recite in Quran. Yeah. And uh, how he was mind blown by it. That's right. And how there is this other tribe leader that uh, he was told that he, plug your ears when you hear, like, uh, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Obviously, they didn't say Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam when you, when, you, when you hear Muhammad. And, like, basically, you just plug your ears because it's like magic. And uh, he was at some point, like, he heard it and was like, oh, that must be it. And uh, he plugged him, like, you know what? I'm the, I'm, I'm, a, I'm the, Tribe leader. Yeah, Tufayl ibn Amr al Dosi. Yeah, I was like, I can't do that. So I actually listened to it and he was fascinated. He learned Islam, but I'm like, what is it that they listen to? Like, right. I want to know what is it, like, how come I'm not feeling what they're feeling? What is it that I don't understand that they did? Yeah. So yeah. that's kind of like what, that was kind of like the tipping point with divine speech, actually. I hope you guys become a motivation for many others, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah to engage you. with the Quran. Uh, and Allah protect both of you. I'm really grateful that you guys came. Thank no, you very, thank you much, very much, much for having us. us. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. No, thank you. Zakum khairan. Hope you guys enjoyed this discussion. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Okay.